The Educational Practitioner. This is a video by me, Andrew Thomas, at Ostfold University College, which I would like my One School for All students to watch before we next meet on the 22nd of August 2024. Um, so once we meet, I hope we have all um, thought about this a little bit. Um, so that's the plan. And the first lecture I'm going to give you um, is about some some of the practical um, aspects of uh, science about education, some of the um, structures in which our educational practice takes part. Um, so we're going to talk about knowledge and practice in schools. And I want to start with a book that I'm reading at the moment. Um, I will not always um, talk about the things that are just on the reading list, but you don't have to read this. I'm reading this. Desperate Remedies by Andrew Scull. It's a kind of history of psychiatry and mountain illness in um, recent decades. And one of the most colourful and tragic characters in the book is Walter Freeman, um, here pictured in his, uh, what other people refer to as, lobotomobile. Because Walter Freeman was um, eager to do lobotomies. Early in his career, um, he had addressed some small, few cases of um, mental illness p patients who, um, who were difficult to handle, who were troublesome to their hospitals, um, and, um, and had psychotic episodes, um, and could have been violent, for example. Um, but after doing a lobotomy, where you cut off some of the frontal lobe materials, in fact, it was um, a much less um, accurate and um, specific operation than that um, phrase suggests. Um, after Walter Freeman had been at them with his, um, with his apparatus, with his tools, um, they were much more docile, uh, much calmer. Um, and that's because a lobotomy is a brutal way of taking away a, an essential part of the brain that you need in order to be who you are. Um, they, um, so people were laid back afterwards, clearly not troubled by psychotic episodes, um, but also um, less who they are. Um, so today we would think of this as a... Um, a brutal way of um, treating anybody at all, um, least of all patients who are in a vulnerable situation. But because of the few observations that um, the Walter Freeman did in his very early career, he thought this is a really good thing. And right up until his death in 1984, um, he would go around and he would do any number of lobotomies, many, many, many in, 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 in the course of one day. Um, literally hundreds of people um, were, fell under his knife. And the question is, what went wrong with science during the career of Walter Freeman? Now, Andrew Scull um, portrays this as a failure in research methodology. Um, instead of um, doing some um, looking for problems, uh, Walter Freeman looked for signs of success. Um, and he based it on a few cases, and the few cases that he referred to were probably not nearly as successful as he gave us to believe. And why was this? Why did it take so long to to refute this? Um, we just did not use good enough data. And one of the solutions that, um, that came after Walter Freeman's time was the science practitioner, as to say, somebody that would um, try something out and observe what the results were. And this science practitioner idea is actually um, um, has its roots in the Middle Ages when um, during the Arabic Revolution, the, the Arabic Enlightenment, we should say, maybe, um, the, um, the two institutions of the university and the hospital um, got together. Um, hospitals needed the best possible researchers and the best possible research results. But universities also needed um, something to study, some kind of data. Um, and they could produce medicines, but what they wanted to know was what effects these medicines had. And some um, medical um, researchers like Ibn Sina um, used the hospitals and the large number of patients in order to find not just one or two, but hundreds of patients who, could, um, who he could observe to find out what happens when you give them this particular kind of treatment. Um, and they, they needed to ask the question, 
on the one hand, what do we know about um, who we are treating? What are they suffering from already? And secondly, a very clear um, identification of what we're trying out. What is the intervention? And thirdly, what are the results? And really importantly, what are the results on people that we don't try the intervention on? Um, and, and that kind of control situation was something that really we developed in the 20th century and was essential for assessing um, medical interventions. By the time of Freeman, this was normal practice in medicine, but um, with um, mental illnesses, um, it took a long time for people to start doing the same thing. Um, and it wasn't until the late 70s and 80s that we were doing that kind of um, well, well-grounded experiment in, um, with mental illness as well. So the observation goes both ways. Doctors needed to hear what the um, what how to do the interventions, but the universities needed to find out what the interventions um, what consequences the interventions had, and that is why um, in inclusive education um, we're doing something similar. We're asking similar questions about what works in schools, and it's vital in inclusive schools because. Um, because in inclusive schools in which we try to keep as many pupils together as possible, where um, instead of saying um, special schools um, pupils go somewhere else, we're saying actually no, pupils um, have the greatest benefit from being held together in social groups. Um, pupils need each other. We have a pupil that we don't understand and we don't necessarily know why they're not benefiting from um, the kind of classroom activity that we're doing with everybody else. Um, but also we've got um, we've got scientists who are, who are um, who've got approaches that they need to test. So we've got a similar situation to with the university um, hospitals in the Middle Ages, um, and we need to um, on the one hand the schools have a problem because they now have. Um, a greater variety of pupils instead of just doing this one ordinary education that fits for everybody. We've got lots of people for whom that ordinary education no longer fits. Um, and, and the first question is, um, the schools need to know, or oh, why doesn't it fit? And the, and the specialists, special needs educationalists, for example, can help us to examine this pupil and say, well, it turns out your, um, your pupil doesn't fit your ordinary class because their hearing is impaired, or they have an emotional imbalance, or they are on the autistic spectrum, something like that. But um, but we can also switch places, um, and um, and the universities can then say, but we we've tried these things here, why don't you try it out? And then we'll and then we'll get the data and we'll find out whether it works here as well, and we'll we'll find out whether this intervention will work in your school. And again, they need to ask this question: What kind of pupils are we using this on? What did we try out? And what was it that happened? And this is good both for the universities, but it's also good for the for the schools themselves because they're trying out new things, uh, and they are instead of just doing the ordinary education for everybody and hope it really fits, um, they are um, they're trying to find a way of doing education which will fit people who are on the autistic spectrum, for example, people with different uh, living with different kinds of disabilities, um, and um, and and we're trying to f um, find ways of including people in the same school. And this is why we've got so much evidence-based education. And this, you'll find this in the in the one of the key messages in education. In order to have inclusive schools, we also need to have schools which will experiment and try things out, which will generate and use data in order to find ways of doing education which does not exclude pupils. And if you find this a little uncomfortable to hear that in schools, we do experiments on children. Um, that's perfectly natural because some of the th some of the things that generated the lobotomobile are also what will generate this um, um, this experimental way of do dealing with inclusive education. We also we always need to worry about the seriousness of an education, um, and instead of saying, "Well, these people have no rights because." Um, they're in a disastrous situation anyway. We need to be. We need to. Um, we need to pause 
when people are making an emergency about a situation say well no this is somebody's serious education they only get one education and we're not going to um, just sacrifice that education for the sake of science so that's one of the problems does this take education seriously enough another problem is do we even know what recovery looks like or like like a successful education do we even know what that looks like um, we're quite good at finding out what doesn't work um, but do we have a um, a similar vision about what a healthy life looks like and what the education what the educated like life looks like and the third problem is maybe that this gives the impression that as long as we do different things to different people um, then that's that's going to work uh, but in actual fact it would seem like Different solutions aren't always um, the way forward. On the contrary, what gathers people together, or what we all have in common, um, is much greater than what, what divides us. And this is the, um, this is the point of Dehane, who's doing um, um, educational and um, neurological research on how we learn. He says, in actual fact, there's not a massive difference between um, the different ways that brains learn. Most people learn in much the same way. The point I want you to uh, remember is that um, inclusive education has a long history. Um, in inclusive education has a relationship to knowledge and data. And it has some really um, identifiable practices. And we're going to be studying some of these practices as well as the science and the data that um, bases them and generates them in the weeks to come.